how do you believe it in your heart of hearts so much that you can explain it to people and move them and get them to embrace your cause and work towards you with all their effort? Because this is what leadership is about, right? Even if you make a decision for a North Star, you can't do it alone. You shouldn't do it alone. Otherwise, we wouldn't build companies. We wouldn't have teams. Mm. And so your North Star and your uncertainty and vulnerability should be enough to move people's actions and hearts even to some extent. Mm. And so how do you do that? First, you need to be honest with yourself. I guess that's my party bag gift. Be honest with yourself. Be sure when you're sure. Be unsure when you're unsure. But then take steps to become sure because ultimately there's people who depend on you setting a fixed and clearly defined North Star, Mm. whether if it's the right one or the wrong one, but it needs to be fixed. Welcome to 99 Humans. My name is Jeff LaCosta, curious coach and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, striving to understand how little things generate big impact. And I'm Nadia Carta, tech executive and lifestyle coach with a mission to transform lives and corporations by kindling hearts to generate a zeal for life. Each week, we investigate stories about the human side of leadership to re-energize your spirit and help you become a stronger leader. Because the reality is that leadership is messy, goofy, challenging, but always human. Thanks for spending time with us today. Let's dive in. Jeff, Paolo and I go back many years ago, and Paolo, I don't know, you want to share maybe with Jeff how we met before we get in? Sure. I mean, we were both pretty green at Google at the time, right? I mean, I think we joined around the same time, and it was a very long time. When was it? Like 2009, I think you joined? 2009, almost 14 years ago. Yeah, wow. Okay, yeah, it's been a while. So, and uh, we were in this like really like high stakes, high pressure sales team. And that's, that's how we started. And then we took different paths, right? I mean, I was in Nadia, like stayed in Google and did like, had an awesome career in there. I went more the route of, I stayed in Google for a while as well, but then I went more the route of like the startups scene in London. And uh, yeah, but it's been, it's been a, it's been a long journey. Nadia has also lived all over the place, so it's been hard to keep up, but we met like, you know, I think we crossed paths randomly and like, what was it, a 10K or a 20K you ran in Milan or something? We randomly crossed yeah, paths that's there. Right, that's right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's been Serendipitous. quite the, yeah, that's the word. Exactly. I see we all share the coaching kind of foundation as well from your LinkedIn. So I'm curious how that enters into the conversation, but I'm sure you know that Nadia is a very passionate coach, me too. And that has kind of been one of the sparks for us on starting this podcast is curiosity about human beings, passion for people, and remembering that leadership, humans dealing with humans and trying to remove that facade of It's the strategy and it always looks professional. And we think of these high up positions as really buttoned up and often that's not what it looks like. So I think that thread certainly is shared between all three of us. Yeah, maybe I should lose the jacket. I feel like you want me more casual. Should I lose the jacket? (laughs) Let's take off the jacket, (laughs) Paolo. Let's do it. Let's start. Yeah, that's good. (laughs) You know what? Just to show that leaders are uh, humans too. There you go. Oh, now, that's just good. Slightly, All right. less, slightly less bottomed up. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, you see, I knew that with Paolo, we would have had a good laugh. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. Let's let's keep going. So, what's what shall we talk about today, guys? Well, I guess, Paolo, here's the thing. When I think about you, you did so many things in your career and you started managing big teams also super early. And I would love for you to identify a messy story. I'm sure that when you were hiring in the early days of Mighty Highs and when you were managing those people and the situation, there must be things that probably were complicated or stories from your life that when you think back, 
you're like, oh yeah, that was a defining moment and it was a bit messy. Oh yeah, I, how much time do you have? I mean, I, <laughs> I have quite a few of those stories. <laughs> so, I mean, it depends, right? I think that uh, there, there are so many, I, I, but I think a common thread among the stories that are just bouncing through my mind and maybe I'll, I'll tell you one specific one, but generally speaking, one thing about leadership that I had to realize is that even leaders are not sure of the answers, right? And so like you think that a leader is someone who knows maybe better than you or can figure it out better than you. Well, there is some truth to that in that hopefully the leader has some valuable experience that they can bring in, in, in making the best guess. But again, you make all decisions as a best guess, right? And it's very important, I think, to share with everybody else you're working with this this uncertainty, this insecurity, because it's completely fine. It's actually, it's actually a lie to to pretend that you know what you're doing, right? In that that you know the answers and you know that your decisions are the right one. You still need to be decisive. As a leader, you still need to make those decisions because people you're leading, they need a clear direction. So a leader should define the North Star, which is like what we're all aiming towards, right? But it's okay, I think, to just say that like, well, I don't know if that's the right North Star. I'm just saying we're going there and I'm sharing with you maybe how I got to this decision and what are the risks involved. The things we know that we know, but there's also things we know we don't know. And there's possibly things we don't even know we don't know. So, and I guess that's very important to share in that journey because you need to have people like, on the one hand, everybody needs to be laser focused and all rowing in the same direction because if you don't, the boat doesn't go well, it doesn't go as fast as it could go, and it doesn't go as well as it could go, and you have morale problems and all that. But at the same time, it's you need to keep that 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 honesty because you know that you know also it's also a way to form future leaders. Like maybe I'm rambling here a bit, but like it's I think it's a message that is very important to convey because at every level you have leaders, right? So maybe you're quite far up, but then you have people, even at like people who don't manage anybody, they need to make decisions every day. And if they don't know what the North Star is and they don't know, you need to define it so well without the shadow of a doubt, these people need to be able to make the split second decision at 4 p.m. on a Wednesday without every time having to like over bureaucratize things and like be a bottleneck and stuff. And also empowering them because someday they will make to make bigger decisions. If you don't empower them to make the relatively smaller impact decisions today, they will never be able to make bigger decisions tomorrow. So I think it's very important to communicate this as a leader. In terms of messy stories, I mean... Before I mean, I, you share your messy story that proves this point, it really resonates to me because even though what you've said is so true, leaders aren't fully confident themselves, I still struggle with that. And I look at leaders that I work around and I forget all the time that they're also kind of making it up as they go along. Before you share your story, why do you think that's the case? Why is it so hard for us to remember that leaders mm. don't always know what they're doing? I think it's a combination of things. That's a very good question. I think, first of all, there's like, I don't know if it's the media or whatever, the way we were brought up, like we are to believe that, or we were led to believe that leaders need to be like projecting the image of perfection and absolute confidence and honestly cockiness because I'll get to this point in a second. You can be uncertain and can be confident at the same time. Yeah. And this is actually a point that I want to make. But so we have this warped idea of what confidence means that to me it borders bravado very often, which is not what I think confidence should be and what I think good leadership should be. Also, it's hard to admit that you don't know, right? It's hard to admit that you may be wrong and it's hard to show that vulnerability. And I think one of the biggest lessons that led me to accept that vulnerability and actually to share it is one of my former CEOs and he's like I still consider him one of the most successful and most inspiring men I ever had the privilege of meeting up close right and he once said and I can never forget this it was just like just like any other old hands when he was talking and he always said insightful things he would just say them so casually that you could almost miss them if you blinked and one of the things that he said was I was talking about making mistakes and like, oh, I still mess up every day. And that sentence, I still use it in my coaching, by the way, when I'm, when, because I, I do executive coaching with leaders and they all share this uncertainty. And finally, 
when they have a sounding board like me in this case, they share it more openly than maybe they would. Anyway, he said this and I was like, wow, if he still messes up, he didn't say I make small mistakes. Yeah, he's like, I still mess up every day. And this guy probably makes like 100 decisions a day. I don't know, something, probably not 100, but that, that kind of order of magnitude. And like he, if he messes up every day, then it's totally okay for me to mess up every day. In fact, and this is the thing, I think one of, one, one of the things that has been my strength uh, since is that some people say they're afraid of failure and so this slows them down, even paralyzes them sometimes. And I could tell you I'm not afraid of failure, but that's not even it. I'm, it's not that I'm not afraid of failure. I assume that I will fail. Since that day, I assume that I will mess up something every day. So because that's a certainty, I cannot stop because it doesn't matter. Whatever I do, something will be messed up. And so why hesitate? I think that goes beyond not being afraid of failure. Because when you say, I'm not afraid of failure, there's still part of you that is. But when you assume failure, like I woke up this morning, it's, it's morning here in Tokyo. I, by, the end, by the time I go to sleep, I will mess something up. And that's fine. That's very liberating, right? And I think that's something that many people don't understand. I only had the privilege to understand because of just, just these chance encounters and chance conversations that I had. But I think that's, that's been one of my greatest strengths since. And if anybody who's listening, I want to convey this and hopefully it will inspire someone else to just let go of that fear because there's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, it's a certainty. So what's the point in, in, in hesitating? It's a very refreshing approach, Paolo. And I'm wondering, that moment that person said, oh yeah, I still mess up every day. Yet sometimes it's kind of a paradox because... You could say, well, you're still the CEO, so sure, you're mess up every day. Like, how to be at peace with the fact that, yes, you're going to mess up and fail. And at the same time, you're going to have pretty several successes, too. So how to reconcile these two concepts? That is a very good question. And I think I'm going to try to answer concisely because it's not simple, but it depends who you're talking to, of course, right? I mean, here we're assuming we're talking about leadership. So, and when I do my exec coaching, I'm talking to accomplished leaders, right? So people don't hire me you know, unless they already have like a, a company that is somewhat successful and they're not already accomplished people. Here I'm talking about high achievers in securities. First, you want to become a high achiever. And I think it's very important, especially early on, to be very earnest and work hard and do your best. All the, the good old stuff, right? Some of the good old stuff seems ring, still rings true, I think. We're trying to redefine leadership, but we shouldn't forget the basics, which is like none of us three have gotten where we got by not working hard and not putting our best foot forward. So when I say I'm going to mess up every day, it doesn't mean I'm just going to half-ass things. Oh, excuse my French. It doesn't mean I'm just going to be, I'm not going to be thorough in my approach. Of course, I'm going to do my best. Shoot, Paolo, yes, I like where you were going with, you know, <laughs> It's all good. All right, great. I love it. I'm a bit off the cuff here. So, uh, do they have I mean, coffee like, in Tokyo, by the way? Do they have coffee? I mean, yeah, I'm not going to say it's the best <laughs> coffee you'll ever have, but it exists. It's actually quite trendy. I think this is a personal uh, opinion. I think that obviously they have amazing tea over here. But if you're young and cool, you're going to go to get coffee. You're not going to go to get tea. So I say I you go get coffee, Paolo, because you're young and cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, I definitely will. Thank you, Nadia. I appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, no, but seriously, what was, gonna, what was I saying? This is all fun. I see I'm losing my track, my train of thoughts. No, but I know you when you were saying it doesn't mean I'm half assing it. it. You're still yes. working hard. The basics of high achievers still apply even to leaders and CEO positions. Absolutely. So the assumption is you're going to do your best. And as you've probably gotten where you've gotten because you've put in the app, you've gained the experience. And you've learned also through mistakes again, uh, your best is probably good enough, but it's not good enough to be successful 100% of the time. It will never be. That's what I mean, right? So when I talk to high achievers and I tell them, you will mess up and it's okay. But of course, like Nadia points out, the majority of the time you'll probably do right. I'm just saying, but out of the 50 th decisions you may make in a day, who cares if you mess up one, two, or even five? That's fine. In fact, that's it's just the way of life, basically. You can't avoid it. Well, I like, I like your premise when you said, wait a moment, we are still talking about high achievers. 
when we're talking about leaders, I mean, there are two things that are staying with me from what you said is that number one, this concept of constant decision making and empowering others to have that ability. And then number yes. two, yes, you do mistakes, but eventually we're talking about people that are still accomplishing lots in life. So give yourself permission to fail and at the same time do work really hard. So we're not giving permission everyone to just not doing anything. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I have to, I mean, uh, this like, and, it, and this also goes like when you're coaching people, for example, right? Or when you're coaching, when you're coaching leaders, when you're doing executive coaching, there is some understanding that they have a background where they've proven hard work and excellence. But also when you're coaching junior people, you want to listen for the cues. You cannot, like if people, you can only elevate them if they show the will. And this is very important right? You cannot make a horse drink the water. You can just take the horse to the water. So everything we're saying here, everything about leadership, it implies a level of effort and motivation. Mm. And that's just the baseline. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. So your story one... then. Oh, sorry. I was going to kind of ask for a specific story, Paolo. I wonder when we started, you said, I've got too many. How much time have you got? And then yeah. we took a little tangent because you said something around leaders not being confident. But I'd love to hear a time either when you weren't confident or maybe you didn't drink the water yourself as the horse in the example mm -hmm. or you were working with somebody. When was it messy for you? Yeah. So um, let me see. I want to tell you about a time. There was a time when this is like the theme here is like making hard decisions that you don't know if they're going to be the right decision, right? So there was a time where I was, I was director of sales for a startup in London. And, and, and basically we had really, 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 really like high sales growth targets to hit because what happened is that we were fundraising. And as, when a startup is fundraising, that's another way to say we're about to run out of money. And uh, which is all, it's all fine and well. It's the name of the game, right? You're supposed to like burn through cash quickly. That's what your investors want. Of course, not to the point of failure. That's what they don't want. But at the same time, they don't want you to be conservative or go slowly. So you are supposed to run out of money every so often until you, you achieve financial stability or you do an exit through acquisition or merger. So at this point, we were at that stage. And I knew my CEO was like full time busy fundraising. But in order to do a successful fundraise, I was tasked with showing a very aggressive revenue growth in this Q2 of this year. So one night, uh, me and my CEO were having a beer, as you do in London, of course, and a pint rather. And so, and we were talking and he told me about, like, just randomly, just chit-chatting about this interview he watched the night before. This interview was with Eddie Murphy. Of course, you know the guy, right? Absolute, absolute legend. And one of the questions that the interviewer asked Eddie Murphy was, like, what's the secret of your success, right? And Eddie Murphy replied, oh, basically, I did not give myself a chance not to be successful. I mean, I had no plan B. It was either I become a big-time actor or that's it, I fail. And because I had no plan B, I focused 100% on making that happen, and it happened. Now, of course, this was very inspiring, but of course we all know you, you cannot be sure of this happening. But there is some great truth to this. Like, if you have no plan B, and you focus 100%, you have a better chance than if you play conservative. And we had no plan B at this point. So I, because I looked at the numbers, and I'm like, to reach this, specifically this growth that I need to reach, we cannot lose time with smaller opportunities. We just need to go for the whales. Like this is this sounds like some very cliche, but in this case, guys, I could, I don't have the reports anymore. But if I showed them to you, it was pretty clear because there was like the whales were huge, and a myriad of other smaller opportunities would not have made up for the whales, right? And we had no time to pursue all. So I'm like, we also needed to ditch some clients. So we had some revenue coming in, and I'm like, we need to ditch that too. We don't have the resources to maintain a few small clients and to pursue the new whales. So it was a complete gamble. And so I asked my CEO, I'm like, shall we do like Eddie Murphy? Shall we ditch plan B completely and just focus on plan A? And he's like, yes, please do that. 
And mind you, this was a very clear North Star. The next day I talked to my team and I also rallied. I was responsible for the sales team directly, but of course I was working closely with our VP of products, with our tech team, and also in terms of like how the product should evolve to accommodate some requests that some product feature requests that the whales had that I knew of. And I'm like, guys, we need to just refocus completely this quarter. And to be quick, by the way, because the clock is ticking and there was a, a little poster in the office with my picture at some point with a little balloon saying the clock is ticking because I said it all the time. And as, a, as another CEO of mine said, 90% of leadership is repeating yourself. And he said it all the time. So just to, to reinforce that, right? And so just that North Star needs to be relentlessly repeated. But like this was a gamble. And by the nature of gambles, I wasn't sure it would work out. And the team knew, right? So when I was asking them to do difficult things like telling their client, because at the end, it was the account manager who had to kind of ditch the client. I mean, of course, I was in the conversation. I was supporting them, but it was a personal relationship for them too. But you need to people. I think it's fundamental to get people to trust you through these difficult times to be open with them, to be like, hey, even I don't know if it's the right thing to do that I'm asking you. Yeah. But you look at how I came to my decision and I would share my decision-making process because why not? This is also part of vulnerability to be like, look, this is how I came up with this. It's not because I'm some genius or I know better than other people. I looked at these numbers and this is my decision. Now, and by the way, this invites people to tell them. This is the other thing. Like, If you admit that you could be wrong, you also welcome feedback from the bottom up. Which doesn't mean this becomes a democracy all of a sudden or you have to do what everybody tells you to do, but it empowers people to speak up. And frankly, I don't care how experienced the leader is. Two brains are always better than one. Three brains are always better than one, etc. Therefore, there was a lot of healthy conversation also about how we would exactly go about doing this, which if you show that vulnerability, you're obviously implicitly open to and you encourage people to speak up. Whereas if you're like, you know, this like hard, I don't know, hard-faced leader who always shows, displays, you know, overconfidence, people are not going to speak up and you're going to miss tremendous opportunities for amazing conversation and for actually learning something and changing your approach for the better. So I think overall, hopefully I didn't say too many things here. It's like so many magical things happen when you share your thought process as opposed to pretending you know better and you share your uncertainties. But still, firmly. It's not that everybody who spoke up to me and like, oh, you're right, let's do your thing now. Of course not. Paolo, how did these people react, right? Because so you were under pressure, everyone was under pressure, and you shared your decision-making process, but was everyone on board? Was some people saying, Paolo, what the hell are you talking about? Like, what was the reaction from the ground? I think in this case, they were all pretty supportive. I think, and I I don't know exactly what went through their heads, but if I had to guess, I would say that sharing the decision-making process, I shared the story about Eddie Murphy, like everything I told you right now, it was all honest. And by the way, one, one of the reasons why I love this example when we talk about human leadership is that it also highlights the beauty, the imperfect chance encounters. Like what if my CEO had not watched an interview with Eddie Murphy the night before? What are the odds, right? What if we didn't have that beer that day? Maybe we had that beer a few days later and you didn't think of Eddie Murphy. You know what I mean? Like so many beautiful things about, about this. that I'm very fond of that memory. But sharing all the details of how humanly imperfect this was. But also, as I said, it was factual. I had numbers at hand. I knew what I was talking about. So, and that's another important thing, by the way. I think a leader, when a leader is open to criticism or feedback, the leader should have done his or her homework before. Because it can't be just like, oh, yesterday I thought of doing this thing. What do you guys think? No, this is solid. I have made my decision. Feel free to change my mind. And this is not there. It's like, please. But normally what I said is like, look, I love it when someone convinces me that I'm wrong. Because I normally really think through my decisions. So if someone can then convince me I'm wrong, I'm definitely going to learn something from that experience, right? Because I've done my best. And this is what my brain is telling me is the only, or not the only, but the one best decision. So if you can convince me that it needs to be changed, oh my God, I'm so grateful. But it doesn't happen often, guys, as you can imagine, right? So 
but it's still I, every time I value it, it happens, I value it so much, and it has happened before. In this case, it, it didn't happen <laughs> just because it was uh, maybe because it was such a big gamble. Like, and the decision making process was sound, as I said. Like, we didn't have a plan B; we didn't have an option to have one. But without going into many other stories right now. I have other examples where people have changed my mind. And actually, I always encourage them to try. It's a bit of a challenge, but some people take it. Paolo, so I'm guessing part of what makes this story so fond in your mind is that you hit the target. Is that right? Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. We did. And it was insane. Like the way and just to give you a little detail as to why it was so important to focus everybody on this. So imagine I had gone this alone in a way. I said like everybody, hey, continue doing what you're doing. I, however, I will not maybe focus on new opportunities. Let's say keep servicing this relatively smaller clients. A bird in the hand is better than two in the bush, right? The conservative approach. And then I will, however, focus the new sales efforts on, on the whales. Because I was at the time, I mean, even if my title was Spence, I was director of sales. I was the only full-time salesperson. Everybody else was kind of supporting me. But I was the guy going out to the meetings. Right. Sometimes I would bring in VP products, even the CEO, whatever. But anyway, so I could have done that, but that wouldn't have worked for the following reason. Before defining meetings with these whales, I spent, and I'm not kidding, pretty much the whole previous day preparing. Of course, you need to do some stuff. You need to answer some emails, etc. But honestly, that's the greatest focus I think I've never had in my career so much free time, obviously not free, but so much time freed for thinking and preparing and studying and rehearsing and everything. and going through the possible objections, preparing my comeback. If I didn't know, contacting people to give me the data, everything. And this would not have been possible if my team had not been freed to do the other stuff that I couldn't be doing. And I promise you, like I had entire days where it, it felt incredible. Then to go into the meeting the next day after all that preparation is, uh, is an experience worth trying, I'm telling you. I'm curious, given you hit the target, you set the goal at the beginning, it is interesting that time in between and you're painting what I would maybe call like a rose-colored glasses, look back, like it was fabulous all this time. But I'm wondering how fabulous it really was when you put yourself back in there and how did you find the courage and also maybe find within the data like the encouragement that you needed to pursue and persist through this really big gamble versus pivoting and going, look, we want to fail fast. It didn't work after 10 days. We're going to go back to the conservative approach. What was it that went through your mind to hold steady? Yeah, that's a very good question. Like, well, a few things. First of all, the data was so stark. I cannot show you a chart right now, but it was quite obvious. <laughs> I don't know. It's like saying, can, like, the data was something like this. Like, oh, can you run a marathon in five minutes? You cannot. It, there's no way, like, there's no way you can slice and dice that data. So if you're like, oh, we already started running, so we might as well try to do it in five minutes. No. It's like, so basically, there was literally no plan B. Like, the whole point was that we either take this gamble or we die a, a slow, unglorious death. So, like, mm. we might as well. So the data, there was never a question in my mind after 10 days. Of course, after 10 days, we had not hit the target yet. But we had a quarter to do that, thankfully, which was a very short time considering. But still, there was no way of reconsidering. After 10 days, it was just, we either do this, so we either die gloriously or we survive. There was no other way. So that, that helped in a way that it was such a clear cut decision at that point. I think like the, it was the initial courage, I think was the most important part to admit to ourselves that we had no other way of doing this as opposed to keeping going. So the pivoting decision done in the beginning precluded all other pivots later. In terms of how I felt, man. Well, but so, uh, Paolo, uh, Paolo, I have one, like, one question here mm -hmm. because I'm, and I'd love to hear how you felt. But then when you speak about courage, what gave you courage? Because you're like, yeah, there's no plan B. I have these people working for me. In the end, I'm the one that is going to see the client. But then you could have failed because all of the odds were against you. What gave you courage? 
I, I don't know. I think, I mean, what else was I going to do? <laughs> I don't know. I think there's something beautiful that happens when you're laser focused. It's like, well, if I fail, I don't know, like I'll find another job, <laughs> basically, right? I mean, we all will have to. So everybody knew. I think it was very important to have the encouragement of my CEO and my team. They all knew it was an impossible mission. It's not like they were like, oh, Paolo, how, where is that revenue you promised us? It was more like, how is it going? Are you still? So I had like all this encouragement because everybody knew how hard it was. And everybody was very supportive. And I think sharing, again, the decision-making process and being completely honest about how hard it was going to be also helped people like rally together and support each other. So I think in my memory, that's what happened. And as I said, yeah, it was not a rosy period. I mean, but I guess what was never questioned, like I could wake up one morning and question whether we were going to make it. I did that every morning, but there was no question about what I should do that day. And that is really powerful because I think indecision has killed more dreams than fear ever will, right? I'm making this up. I guess someone probably said the opposite at one point, but I think indecision is even worse than fear. Getting to a clear North Star. Yeah. To, because what I hear you saying is you woke up every day purpose-driven and that made all the difference. And so did your team because you cleared the decks for them to do the exact mm -hmm. same wake up and here's what I need to do today. But organizations, certainly the ones that I've been a part of in my career, haven't found a way to rally around a clear North Star. I think that it's very, very, very rare that people do wake up and go, this is what I need to do today. So I'm kind of curious, looking across your career, do you feel like you've always been able to find that clear North Star? How do you go about navigating that ambiguity to make it clear without a, you know, life or death of the company kind of approach, <laughs> which is awesome. But then you get, okay, we were successful, but now ambiguity is back. So what should we do this morning? Absolutely. No, and it, you make a really good point that, yeah, when in normal circumstances, you still make, need to make very clear cut decisions and not waver. No, this has not always been the case for me. And in fact, I think that there, is a, there are a few stages of that certainty. I think, in fact, when you're younger and less experienced, you may actually experience more certainty and less wavering, paradoxically. I mean, mm. to quote Oscar Wilde, he said, I'm not young enough to know everything. And I think that's, that, that tells the story. And I knew I was way cockier, way more self-assured. I thought I knew better than my bosses when I was younger, right? And then suddenly... Yeah, but you... also because, Paolo, let's face it, like when you are young, what you lose is a lot less. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. Like until... I, 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 they say it's tough at the top, right? Also, like you lose a lot less, but also... You don't really have to make those decisions. It's easy to be a critic, but when it's your skin in the game, it's a different matter. And that's when you start asking yourself the question, oh, was this the right decision? Because when you're criticizing, you're just like, oh, I think I would have made a better decision. But then when you have to make it, that's when you start questioning, wait, is this the best decision? And then the whole world opens up because when you have unlimited choice, <laughs> good luck choosing, right? And so... And to answer Jeff's question, how do you do that? I mean, I now have a method that I teach, but to summarize it very simply, because obviously we don't have time to get into that. It's like when you're a tailor, you measure twice and you cut once. Maybe you measure 10 times and you cut once. I don't care. Like to, be, to make a decision, to, to choose a North Star that you're so sure about, you need to have thought about it hard and long and not Walking up one morning, as some people think leadership is, and say like, oh, we're going to do this. Even like the whole Eddie Murphy story. I'll take you back to that because even that decision, I casually mentioned I had data at hand before the Eddie Murphy conversation even happened. I mean, I was looking at data every day. And by the way, to look at data every day, first you need to collect the data. You need to put it in a dashboard that makes sense. Like this, data just doesn't come to you. And so I've always been very structured in my approach, I guess, because I have an engineering background. But... Uh, generally speaking, I think every leader should do it. I think it's, uh, 
it's preposterous to, to think of making non-data driven decisions this day and age. But, uh, and be certain of them. Look, maybe you can choose with your guts, but I promise you, your gut will change at some point within the next month. And then what do you do? You cannot your your North Star every month, right? You need to keep it fixed. Like big companies, you need to keep it fixed for a year or more. Startups, a quarter at least. Otherwise, it's like chaos in your company. So yeah, just uh, look at the short answer is like you want to look at hard data and then think of why you made this decision. You want to write down why you made it. You want to question every possible angle, how it could be the wrong decision. Highlight, maybe do a, 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 an easy way to explain is make, do a SWOT analysis of everything you decide, right? And then you write it down. Why? Because tomorrow you wake up or next week you wake up like, shoot, was that the right decision? You look back at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats and why you made the decision, knowing all of that. And you're like, basically, unless there's new information that modifies either your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats understanding, or the decision was the right decision, right? Because uh, if you still know this week what you knew last week, then you don't need to change your decision. So, Paolo, to whomever listening to this episode at the end of it, what would be like your recommendation, your like giveaway gift, right? If you think about like a party bag that someone opens it and something inside, like what is the Paolo <laughs> party bag for the 99 humans? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the party bag. I mean, I think it's a bit of a summary of everything we said, right? I think, uh, how do you choose a North Star that is so fixed where you have no certainties, right? Without being cocky. Because that's the thing. Like, of course, anybody can say, okay, I'm doing this because I say so, right? But how do you mm -hmm. believe it? How do you believe it in your heart of hearts so much that you can explain it to people and move them and get them to embrace your cause and work towards you with all their effort. Because this is what leadership is about, right? Even if you make a decision for a North Star, you can't do it alone. You shouldn't do it alone. Otherwise, we wouldn't build companies. We wouldn't have teams. Mm. And so your North Star and your uncertainty and vulnerability should be enough to move people's actions and hearts even to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so... How do you do that? First, you need to be honest with yourself. I guess that's my party bag gift. Be honest with yourself. Be sure when you're sure. Be unsure when you're unsure. But then take steps to become sure. Because ultimately, there's people who depend on you setting a fixed and clearly defined North Star. Mm. Whether if it's the right one or the wrong one. But it needs to be fixed. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that power. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. It's such a interesting conversation. I mean, maybe as a parting question and then we'll let you go. The North Stars piece and building a clear one resonates with me so much. And maybe it's because I'm struggling with this, maybe with my own team right now. But I also think I see a lot of shitty North Stars. <laughs> like you could do the SWOT analysis and you can pick something. And I was just looking at an article where it was had lined up like six companies, North stars, and you couldn't guess which company went with which North star, like any of them could fit with any of them. Mm -hmm. And it really, I think goes to this challenge of what makes a good one. Even, even if a company thinks maybe they've decided and, They've made a banner that everyone's going to walk beneath on their way to work. Is it really helpful and guiding? I wake up today and I know what to do. That's something that I feel companies are struggling with today. Teams are struggling with that on, yeah, I know I need a vision, a mission, a something, but how do I make it not suck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's a good question. So, I mean, first of all, I think there's, a, there's an important distinction to make. I think the reason you see shitty North Stars, there's two reasons. That there's too much money going around in certain companies. And this could be both in big companies. So some big companies, they don't, of course, they need to do well and survive and deliver to their shareholders and whatnot, right? So it's not like they're exempt from this. But for better or worse, they can afford to be off to some extent, okay? 
And for big companies, mm. my suggestion is for everybody listening, go read Playing to Win by A.G. Lasley, the former CEO of PNG. I have That's that book, Paolo. It's, my God, I have it there. I should take it. It's an incredible... I'm writing it like, down. Yeah, basically, because it shows... It's very hard. That's the other thing, right? When you develop a North Star for a very big company, you have so many stakeholders and so much distraction and so many people to please and also so many voices that need to be heard, by the way, because this is not just about, as we said before, oh, I know what's best. No, it's about dialogue. Two brains, three brains, four brains will always be better than one, no matter what. But how do you make order in that chaos that is 12, 15, very self-assured people shouting to you, I'm right, listen to me, right? So that book oh my God, is your yes. answer. That book is your answer, right? It's, it's a mm. complex answer. It's like a several hundred page answer. So read the book is my suggestion for people working at big companies. I love it. Oh, yeah, I bet you're going to yeah, enjoy it a lot. I did too. Whereas my specialization is to advise startups, and that's a bit different, right? So startups, th there's a really interesting incentive there which is survival however it's not always as you might think if you're bootstrapping yes it's survival 100 percent. but if you have the, if you're taking like a lot of funding it's like doping it could be really well okay no fine that's a wrong comparison because doping is never really good but <laughs> i'm saying it can help the right <laughs> entrepreneurs <laughs> yeah wrong comparison yes oh my god this is being recorded Bit embarrassing, but it's okay. See, I already messed up today. That's my first mess up of the day. I'm counting them. So anyway, it's uh, okay, Paolo. <laughs> this is about being human. Not at all. Exactly. Exactly. That's good. No, but the jokes aside, the founding money can be really good in the hands of the right teams, and also with a bit of luck, of course, because you need. I'm not saying that companies that don't make it are less competent than startups that make it. I'm just saying some startups don't make it, and sometimes there is a reason for that because. They either don't have the right North Star or they execute poorly on their North Star. They're not very focused. But let's talk about the wrong North Star. When you're taking a lot of funding money and you can afford to just spend a lot of money in a very short period of time, you don't have to struggle for survival until it's too late. Because these things are going so fast. Like one, one thing out of place can lead you to failure and you'll never know, did I fail because of that little thing out of place, or did I fail because I had a completely shitty North Star? So it's very hard to see in that, because the time is not very long to really assess whether you are doing the right thing. Mm. So long story short, mm. um, that's why you're seeing shitty North Stars, because the incentives are not fully aligned. Some companies can afford, at least temporarily, to be completely off course. But personally, I have a method that I teach when it comes to setting a North Star for companies up to Series B, from inception to Series B, which is like where, so maybe up to 500 employees, let's say, from 1 to 500, roughly. Uh, and that's a bit, it's obviously less involved than the book I mentioned, because you don't need to deal with that much complexity and that many people. But it is still a very thorough approach where you consider, it's again what I said, you set like a few strategic imperatives three to five maximum you can't do too many things yeah and then you really think them through very well with data at hand do your little swot analysis and you write it down you, you not only do you set them you measure twice and cut once like you're a tailor but also the morning you wake up disheartened or uncertain or confused you read them again and you're like yes that was the right decision and, uh, because you, you will i think it's important paolo to set up front to people that you will wake up this heart and you will wake up doubtful. You will have those thoughts and that's where you're going to need that. You're a hundred percent right. I encourage like leaders should show their SWOT analysis to people to be like, this is why we made this decision. Right. And I've got asked questions. I'll be like, mm -hmm. oh, why are we doing this? Some decisions may be counterintuitive. Why are we doing this? Like the mighty hive, my, my first plan, I said, we're not going to do Germany the first year. And like you open in the UK and you're, you're asking me what other countries in Europe to expand to. And as I said, we did the Nordics, France and Italy first. But of course, the CEO asked me, why not Germany? That's like the biggest economy in Europe is the second largest digital economy. Why not go there? And then I showed him the data of other American companies mm -hmm. who have done Germany the wrong way and what it would take to do it the right way. And I'm like, I'm not going to invest in that way in the first year of the company. In Europe and he said yes so when you explain to people but he could have said no 
this is a super smart, super accomplished guy. And I would have valued him proving me wrong. In this example, he didn't. In some other cases, he totally did in other occasions. So that's why you also explain your thinking because you want to use the collective brain of the company and of people who may be smarter than you or just any adult really who is a hard, a high performer. Let's remember, that's the basics, right? We're talking about really hard work and high performing people. But everybody who's a high performer that talks to you, no matter how young, can contribute something and is worth having the dialogue with. Paolo, where people can find you when they're going to listen to this podcast, which is going to be in a few months from now, if people want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? So it's probably the easiest way is through my LinkedIn, Paolo Pironi. You can look me up. I think it's paolo.pironi, the handle or whatever you call it on LinkedIn these days. I also have a website where you can see maybe some more of my blog articles where you can read a bit about my methodology for setting the strategic imperatives. It's elevatingpioneers.com. Elevating Pioneers is my brand. So yeah, either one of those things. Please get in touch we'll, if you want help. We love it. Thank you so much for connecting from Tokyo. We loved our conversation. So many <laughs> nuggets and party bags. <laughs> thank you. And Thanks, thank you Paolo. so much for having really me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, really. absolutely. Have a good rest of the day. All right, we'll do. Have a good evening. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye, Paolo. Bye. 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 No, yeah, that really was, that was an amazing conversation. God, <laughs> he has a ton of energy. It's seven in the morning. He's in Tokyo. He joins us. I mean, this guy, he's doing so many different things. I remember when Paolo and I were, I think he was 25 and I was 27 fresh out of our first experiences doing cold calls in Dublin. It was... <laughs> Sounds... I mean, uh... like, you made it work. You got through a lot of hard stuff together, so that's when it's fun. Yeah. It Nadia, what are you fun. taking away from that call? Uh, I took six pages of notes, but I guess our listeners are going to read also the book, so there's going to be a lot in there. If I could Pick one. Huh. Oh, God. Well, so I'm going to go with... He said one thing towards the end. There were many, <laughs> but he said one thing towards the end. It says, your vulnerability... He said, hopefully your vulnerabilities will be enough for people to follow you. Mm. And when we speak about human leadership in this podcast... I know that we speak about imperfect leaders and humans. And for me, that resonated. That, yes, of course, you're coming up with a lot of data and research and all of that. But when it comes to believe you and follow you in a North Star, this idea to really show your vulnerabilities and give people permission to fail. So that, that really sticks with me. What about you, Jeff? I'm thinking about helping my nieces and nephews with their homework and showing your work. And the idea of being vulnerable, showing the journey, I mean, gosh, starting with the Eddie Murphy story to the data, to the persistent updates on progress, there's so much on bring that brought people along on the journey. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, there was one little nugget that he offered that really spoke to me. And it's that if you're not sure, you need to become sure. Because there's a part of vulnerable, authentic leadership that I sometimes struggle with where it's a little bit too like human and too messy because it does need to be clear sometimes. And it needs to, in order for it to be helpful guidance for a team, there needs to be a level of confidence. If every decision that's made and every step that's taken comes with all of the homework and all of the work and all of the uncertainty and willingness to shift, you'd be walking all over the place and never actually get anywhere. And I think that becoming sure and then radiating confidence amidst sharing all of the background really is something that is a powerful concept because it's harder than just showing all your homework. You also well, especially before. Jeff because I mean, let's admit it here, would you ever want to work for a weak leader? Yeah. Like and that lack of confidence, it's interesting because that I guess 
is the leadership. That's the weakness. That's the, like, when we say, like, I don't want to work for a weak leader, I mean, that's where it's, well, they're never confident in anything. They could be superhuman, but if they don't have the confidence, we would read them as weak. Well, especially because we need to demystify this narrative that vulnerability equals weak. You can be vulnerable and very confident. Mm. So that, for me, is the holy mm. grail. You are confident, and at the same time, you're given permission to fail, and you're bringing your whole self. So I know we're going to have a couple of leaders lining up that are going to talk about that, but for today, we're going to go away with these nuggets. What a wonderful conversation, Jeff. I love it. All right. We'll <laughs> see you next time. Bye.